This portion of CardioSource video news coverage of AHA 2010 is brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. It's the final day of the American Heart Association Scientific Session 2010, and there are still plenty of physicians gathering to hear the latest and last round of late-breaking clinical trials. Welcome to CardioSource Video News. I'm Dr. Randy Martin. The AHA's scientific sessions are wrapping up today, and one of the most anticipated trials was released this morning, and it's called DEFINE. DEFINE looked at whether a novel drug could safely raise HDL levels while simultaneously decreasing LDL levels, something we've all waited for. And we're fortunate to have one of the principal investigators, Dr. Chris Cannon. Chris is uh, not only with us, but he, as I mentioned, was the, uh, was the principal investigator. He's also associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and he's also editor-in-chief of CardioSource Science and Quality. Next to Chris is Dr. Deepak Bhatt. Deepak is Associate Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Chief of Cardiology at the VA Boston Healthcare System. And rounding out our panel, Dr. Tony DeMaria. Tony is Professor of Medicine at the University of California in San Diego and the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So, Chris, you're the, one of the PIs on this. Tell us about the DEFINE and what, what, what it found. Well, we were studying a, a new drug, anisotropib, which is one of the CETP inhibitors. Uh, we started after a bad experience with a different drug, torcetropib, that uh, had big effects on the lipids but increased mortality in cardiovascular events. It was seen that that had bad effects in the adrenal gland, made blood pressure go up. So this was designed as a safety study in patients to make sure that this new drug wasn't like the old bad one. And, and, and? Well, so we found profound changes in the lipids. So the HDL cholesterol went up 138%. Yikes. So from 40 to 101 on average. So five times what currently available drugs like niacin could do. And then the LDL went down by 40%. And then thankfully, we saw no problems with blood pressure, electrolytes, or any of the other issues seen with torcetropib. And the clinical events, we wanted to do a, a Bayesian analysis to exclude the prior uh, worry about increased events. And so ended up with 94% confidence that this drug was not like uh, torcetropib. Tony, it sounds, and Deepak sounds... Uh... Pretty impressive. Well, the, the change in, in HDL is phenomenal. There's no question about that. But the real question is, does the level of HDL correlate with the function of HDL? HDL. Yeah. And uh, we've all come to appreciate that just having a lot of HDL may not necessarily enhance the transport function of LDL, which is what we're really looking for. So I'm sure in the next round of studies, that'll be an important objective. Uh, that's an important point. Deepak, do we have in the experimental models, or Chris, do we have knowledge that it, that it actually, the HDL that's raised actually does what Tony wants it to do? Well, so far there are uh, models Alan Tall has done showing that the bigger puffy HDL molecules do appear to efflux cholesterol out of macrophages. So, so far, so good. And I think we we're encouraged by the clinical data that all of the events were tended to be lower. And we actually saw two-thirds reduction in the need for revascularization. These are stable outpatients on a statin. Um, and so that gave us the first hint that this looks like okay. it is actually, so it's actually having the effect having an we effect. Deepak, what's your, I mean, this sounds like a really exciting study. Absolutely. So there's the HDL aspect, but there's also the fact that it did reduce LDL quite substantially. So uh, there's two ways that it could potentially reduce clinical events. And I thought the reduction in revascularization was pretty impressive. It was a large degree of reduction and very statistically significant. Beyond that, in fact, uh, the uh, paper explored the prove-it endpoint for clinical events, and there there was also a significant reduction. So uh, as, one, as best one can tell from a phase two trial, both impressive uh, reductions in surrogate endpoints like LDL and, and raising HDL, but also the clinical events track the right way. 
So, uh, so very. I'm sure you're going to be busy. This is going to create a lot of interest, I think. Well, you know, I think we've been hoping for the HDL story to emerge, and now we're getting drugs that have big effects, and we can see. And so, Rory Collins of Oxford is announcing here also the start of uh, a trial, Heart Protection 3, and it will be also Timmy 55, uh, the reveal study that will be 30,000 patients um, on top of statin uh, to see if this does pan out in, in a global trial. And so that will be starting soon and we'll get the real answer. Super, okay. Well, when we come back, we're gonna turn our attention to a very novel therapy to treat patients whose hypertension is resistant to multiple medications, so stay with us. Special thanks to Novartis Pharmaceuticals Incorporated for supporting continuing coverage of CardioSource Video News at AHA 2010. This is CardioSource Video News coverage of AHA 2010. Welcome back. Another late-breaking clinical trial released today was the Simplicity HTN2 trial. Now, it evaluated whether a unique catheter-based technique could actually lower blood pressure in patients who'd been resistant to three or more medications. Deepak, what's your take on this? I think the results are pretty impressive. It's a small study, 100 patients, but a randomized trial that took folks with resistant hypertension on average on five different antihypertensive medications and then randomized them to this procedure or just plain old meds. And the procedure is basically delivery of radiofrequency energy to the renal arteries right. trying to denervate them. And what was seen at the end of six months was a pretty impressive reduction in blood pressure, about 33 uh, millimeters of mercury lower uh, systolic with the denervation procedure. And Chris, these people, these were patients who had really pretty significant systolic hypertension. Yeah, I think it was well-documented patients, and we all have a few that you keep trying one medication after another. And um, the investigator said that he's been working on this for, you know, two or three decades, finding that the sympathetic tone in the renal artery has been known to be much higher, and so that's the pathophysiologic basis to go after that particular area. You know, Tony, when you think about these people being on five or more drugs, it says three, but many of them were on five or more, as Deepak has pointed out, this would be pretty... Uh pretty striking if this is truly this effective. Oh, this is a very important step on the way to efficacy, showing that you can drop the blood pressure, and presumably events will, will also fall. That remains to be seen. But you know, the hypertensionologists have often said that the total number of patients with truly resistant hypertension is much smaller than it seems when you eliminate the patients with sleep apnea who are taking NSAIDs or have some renal failure and whatnot. But in that subset of patients who can drive you nuts, uh, you know, this is an important step forward. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's really unique. And since we do have all this brain power here and the that we do have a lot of brain power. I'd really like to see what each of you think. Sort of what's your highlight of the conference? Tony, let me start with you. Sure. Well, I think there's a lot of highlights. The rocket trial uh, with Rivavoxaban uh, showing again that we may have better drugs than heparin. That was, uh, that was very important. I thought the emphasis trial showing the efficacy of aldosterone blocking, in this case with aplerinone, uh, is going to make me go back and be more aggressive with, with the use of, of those agents. And in terms of my own research, I was pleased to see that guiding therapy in heart failure with natriuretic peptides looked that, like it, it yielded a better ultimate effect than just uh, standard therapy. Okay, so Deepak, your highlights? Well, I would agree with a lot of those. I thought the rocket trial was quite important because it gives us yet another sign that we can do better than warfarin, uh, better in terms of efficacy, certainly better in terms of safety. So that's very encouraging news for the large number of patients right. with atrial fibrillation. I also thought Chris's trial, Define, was extremely important because it showed that we can build upon what we're doing currently with high-dose statins and still reduce LDL, and in the case of that drug, raise HDL, and in a very encouraging signal, reduce adverse ischemic events. 
Chris, you can you can't talk about define, but you can no, you can't. Yeah. I mean, well, what you know, what strikes you? Well, I think you know we had a lot of interesting stuff with heart failure. So the other big intervention in mild to moderate heart failure is a plerinone that right. completes the spectrum, and then CRT therapy also was seen to have a a, a benefit you know, on mortality and and heart failure rehospitalization. So that. Um, the management of heart failure now has uh, some advances. Then other, there are a whole bunch of negative studies here, but some of which will help us get rid of things. So mm -hmm. the simple telemonitoring, we realize that managing heart failure is not just typing into a computer, right, but right. we really have to manage it. And, um, you know, so that... Uh, There'll be other things we'll stop using, like N-acetylcysteine, I think, is uh, something that we have been using the last month on service. So uh, simplifying things to things that really work. So a fun uh, meeting to see well-done big trials. Um, I suppose the Natricor uh, study showed there was not a mortality deficit with uh, nisiratide. Uh, but it also showed that in a big real-world setting with aggressive regular therapy, there wasn't a benefit. So we're going to be pulling back on a few things as a result of these trials, not just adding adding more. And we'll yeah. add some new advances. It's interesting to me because we're in the middle of, a, of an economic, obviously, change in the way we all practice medicine. And so, Tony, looking at the studies and all of you, the DEFINE study, the Rocket AF, these concepts, um, they will hopefully change outcomes, might they impact the economics of the practice of cardiology? Well, I think, I think they will. I think uh, that uh, if I was projecting five years in the future, I would say one of the important messages of, of this meeting was a lot of things that we do that really don't work, N-acetylcysteine, um, uh, perhaps uh, BNP nisiratide, uh, uh, for, for the sonographers of the world, the AV, AV uh, optimization, optimization yeah, which is tedious. And the other message will be, I think, if, in fact, an aniseptopib really uh, is functionally effective, I think five years from now, that will be the biggest news from this meeting in reducing residual risk. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and Chris, you obviously and Deepak, you both look at quality, and I wasn't minimizing quality. So if we have changes that impact the quality of our care and the economics, and I think some of these presented here really looked at that. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you raise a good point, though, that economics is becoming increasingly important part of what we do and what we factor in. But when you've got trials like RAFT that right. showed that cardiac resynchronization therapy reduced mortality in, in folks with class 2 or class 3 heart failure, well, that's not a cheap therapy, but it's reducing mortality. So cost is important, but if you can reduce mortality and improve quality of life, well, I think that's more important than cost. And, 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 and it's going to be very important for all of us to prove that point to the, uh, the economic gods out there. So, I mean, I appreciate all of you being here. The uh, panel has been great for their insight provided during the HA Scientific Sessions 2010. And we thank each of you for joining us. For a complete overview of the sessions, be sure and check cardiosource.org. And we're also looking forward to providing you full coverage of ACC 11 and I2 Summit 2011 in New Orleans. I'm Dr. Andy Martin, and we'll be seeing you there.